What's up, YouTube? Welcome to the Hot Sauce. This is Angel Planell, a registered dietitian nutritionist in Seattle, Washington. I just cracked 100 subscribers, and the goal is to make it to 250. So do me a solid and like, comment, and subscribe, and let's get right into it. Today, we are going to feature Christopher Taylor, a registered dietitian nutritionist that resides in Columbus, Ohio. Welcome back to the hot sauce. Today we're going to feature Chris Taylor. Chris is one of the guys that I know in the field and I appreciate him being here today in the on the hot sauce. He's going to be in the hot seat. No, there's no hot seat. <laughs> but I'll go ahead and put you on the big screen here. So I guess if you could, could you introduce yourself? Tell us about your journey into the profession. What inspired you to join? What did you do for college, your internship and your current job? Yeah, I'm Chris Taylor. I'm a PhD in nutritional sciences from Oklahoma State. Uh, I started my undergrad degree at Bowling Green in dietetics. I did my master's and in internship at Arizona State. Um, did a short stint as an intern biologist at the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, so NIDDK at NIH, um, working on some of the my early diabetes diabetes studies, uh, or genetics and eating and the whole nine yards, um, went on to Oklahoma state. And then after I finished Oklahoma state, I came here to Ohio state, um, in the division of medical dietetics in the college of medicine since the end of my eight year coming into my 18th year, um, as a faculty member. So, um, so I'm here, I teach, I do research. I'm the director of medical dietetics, as well as um, the director of the coordinated program that we're ultimately slowly phasing out um, for our new uh, future education model program, the integrated master's and internship program, um, the master's of dietetics and nutrition. So I'm the co-director of that program as well. Um, so that kind of my pathway goes all the way from dietetics to Bowling Green here in Ohio, circled the country and ended up an hour from home <laughs> um, <laughs> as a faculty member. So awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for that answer. So I guess the, you kind of told about your journey. So mm -hmm. I guess one question I have is how did you get into academia? Um, you know, I know we usually see people do clinical or food service. What was your, drive for academia. Yeah. Well, it's, it's one of the, I always kind of see my pathway is a circuitous route, somewhat of uninformed decisions. Um, so I think there's something to be said for having your path, feeling like you have your path fully laid out and not quite knowing exactly where you're going to go. And that sometimes things don't always go the same way as you're thinking. So I ran track and cross country junior high and high school and our cross country coach was always one of these, you know, you have to have all the, you have to train right, but you have to eat right. You have to, you have to have your family life, right. You have to have your schooling, right. Um, and he always used to harp on us before we travel for meets. He's like, you can't run a top fuel dragster on low light gas. He'd always tell us that you can't run a top fuel dragster on low light gas that, and you have to pack your satchel. <laughs> You got to pack your bag with the things that you're going to eat. And, and he grained that into us very early on. Um, and then I went to undergrad. I was thinking I might go physical therapy. And I heard about dietetics as an option. And I always thought, oh, that's kind of an interesting path. I like lunch. That was my favorite. Um, that was my favorite subject in school was lunch. So, um, so I kind of went down that path and I was really thinking, I'm going to be a clinician. I'm going to be a clinician. I'm going to be a clinical dietitian. And um, I applied to programs with a graduate degree because one of my instructors said, you should get a, you should get a master's degree. You can get an intern. You can get an assistantship and they'll pay for it. You, sh you should really go to graduate school. So I went, OK, I guess I'm going to graduate school. <laughs> so I looked for internships that were matched with a master's degree because I thought, oh, that'll be easier to get than an internship or hard to, internships are hard to get. So. Fast forward, I apply to these, I get a fellowship. I was like, oh man, I wanted an assistantship. Then I found out the fellowship was actually better than an assistantship. I had no idea. <laughs> and in the process, I got matched up to a new faculty member uh, to basically get involved in research and do research, um, which 
just like all the undergrads, I'm sitting in the research class going, why do I need to know this? I want to be a clinical dietitian. Why do I need to know how to interpret it? Well, now I work with Jeff Hample at Arizona State, and he mentors me all the way through the process of presentations and writing publications and doing research. I kind of became the stats guy for all the people in our theses in my, in my internship class. Um, then I thought, okay, he said, you should apply for a PhD. So I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to apply for a PhD. <laughs> so I applied for different places. I got into several places. I um, made some great connections at Oklahoma State uh, from a national conference. So um, I ended up at Oklahoma State on uh, some, a fellowship from some of the work that I'd done uh, collaboratively and ended up with assistantship working with Dr. Kathy Keim, doing more research, a, a very much similar to the lines of what I did at NIH. So I ended up in a faculty line, mainly from, you know, this whole series of, I'm going to be a clinician. Oh, wait, maybe somebody else sees something there that becomes a different option than outside of my scope of view. Um, so it was really about getting involved and getting engaged and seeing how these opportunities, um, these opportunities emerge. Um, they weren't things that I wouldn't have gone after on my own per se, because in my world, I didn't know anything about it. Um, and a lot of people think about research as test tubes and lab coats and things like that, where a lot of the work that I do is around what people eat, how they eat the dietary pattern side. I'm basically a big data nerd is what I am. I work with NHANES data a lot. Um, dealing with 60 some thousand people's dietary recall intakes, but I have this nutrition knowledge as a dietitian that really understands more than just kind of the surface level healthy eating patterns. It's not just fried food and green salad and, you know, whole grains as it's really understanding the complexities of meals and behavior that I can bring to light, especially being a NATO nerd and kind of punching away on all these thousands of records. But I would say the work that I do isn't rocket science, but it's all the understanding about what we eat. That right. somebody that's outside of kind of that dietitian realm can't fully wrap their heads around. So my path to being an academic was really just a whole bunch of incremental steps of getting involved, uh, I still see people that were in the audience when I gave a presentation at Fencing in Atlanta eons ago um, that I got an award for. Actually, that would have been 99. Okay. Um, I was giving a presentation on a, a paper award, and they're still talking about, I remember when you were back there giving your talk on vitamin C at Fencing in Atlanta. So building these, building the network, building the opportunities and getting engaged with the profession, getting engaged with uh, the Academy, uh, back then ADA, but now getting engaged with the Academy and putting yourself out there and being a part, an active part of the profession. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, I, you know, greatly appreciate that answer. And yes, you are. I, I know it's kind of funny because, you know, people, people know you, people see you, you, you came and spoke to some of the spokespeople a couple of years ago. So you, mm -hmm. you've been, you've been around for, for a while. So with that being said, what would you say if um you know if you could do it all over again um what would you change and, and what would you keep the same you know i don't know if you would change your change your journey because it's been a unique journey to you but what would you say yeah um i think the biggest part to all of that is that the definition of the journey and where we're where we think we're going so many people come in with just the, I'm going to do this and I'm going to be, I'm going to do sports. I'm going to do this. I, whenever I talk to the students that like they're applying for internships, when they're applying for jobs and they're applying for programs, I always say, I read three letters. I want to, I want to go into diet. I want to be a dietitian because I want to help people. I did sports when I was in school. And I really think sports is important and uh, nutrition played a big role or I have a history with food or a family member with a health concern. And I think these are all very important drivers of why we wanna, why we wanna go the route that we can. I was like, there are many ways to help people. 
Um, I will tell you everything from sanitation workers to physicians and everywhere in between and above and below, wherever you want to call it, help people. But there are things that can really be the drive of our passion. But sometimes we kind of have to take our blinders off and start to focus on what our opportunities are. Um, we always have some students that are like, I know I don't want to work in this particular area. And some of them that come in, I know I want to work in this area. They start working in there and they say, you know, I'm not really sure about that, but this was awesome. And the more that we get engaged with the profession, taking advantage of the opportunities that we have, that's when the doors that we have open. Absolutely. And those, those become the doors that we have no idea exist. That's why I feel like I'm a kid from Southeast Ohio, and according to the books, I'm Appala the textbooks, I'm Appalachian, I'm socially, culturally, and economically deprived. I came from um, the big city in our area, which was not really a big city. And I wasn't exposed to all of these things. I didn't know about grad school. I didn't know about all these things. I'm really kind of the first generation college student. So what I knew going out and what I was chasing wasn't particularly um, all of the opportunities. Mm -hmm. So with my blinded view on, um, it was my, this is my first step. And then listen to the people who know and um, take in as much as you can. The other part is getting active and engaged, even if you're a student. At the student status, and this is where I always say, tell the students, when you go to the conference and you meet the person who's um, blogging or on Twitter or is writing the articles about the content that you're interested in, go up and talk to them. <laughs> because who's gonna say, no, sorry, I don't wanna talk about my work. <laughs> uh, especially academics. So I'm like, have those conversations, get engaged, because the more that you go, get involved, get engaged, the more you're at the table to find out the things that are available to you, the more people that you meet as a process of, of these, and it creates the impression. I always tell our students, our orientation is the first day of their job interview. How they're gonna act with us is how they're gonna act with their preceptors which the preceptor is then going to be the person who knows the person who wants to hire them or is the person who wants to hire them or knows the person who knows the person who wants to hire them. And your reputation then builds in that way, either positive or negative. So your ability to get active, get engaged, learn more about the profession, see what those opportunities are, because then you become a known commodity and a known name beyond just the name on a resume and your little profile picture about that big. <laughs> right. but, <laughs> but then you become the person behind that. And then when you're finished, just like all the other students, you have the same curriculum. You've met all the same competencies and you've done the same number of hours, but now you have a profile that defines who you are and really helps shape that future that you wanna see. But the more that you can get active engaged, the more you can actually know where those directions take you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it opens your eyes. Sometimes it opens your eyes in a way of, I never thought I would want to do this. And now I've got a great new career path. And sometimes it's, I'm glad I didn't go down that path because that's not for me. Um, so I think those have been some serious learning and growth opportunities, mainly going in blind half the time, I feel like, but, um, just kind of investing my time and myself in, in those experiences has really kind of helped drive me to where I am now. That was an awesome answer. Yeah, I, I always uh, kind of laugh because I, you know, I, I went in, I was sports nutrition. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, here I am 15, 16 years later, geriatrics. And I would have never, I would have never thought about it. And, you know, also me as a spokesperson, I'm like, nah. Mm -hmm. So here we are, and you just got to take a chance and, and try different things. And mm -hmm. yeah, so it's, it's great to hear that, that yeah. you, you encourage your students to have an open mind because, yeah, uh, you know, some people be like, I'm going to, I know for me personally, 
I did not have an interest in TPN or enterals with, you know, ventilated patients. I, I'm more of a people person that like to mm -hmm. interact. So uh, going to see um, a person on the ventilator wasn't, wasn't doing it for me. So I yeah. enjoy speaking with people as I am doing now. So, <laughs> yeah, but so. even, yeah, but even from that perspective, your, your one-on-one -on -one clinical knowledge has Absolutely. helped you in, in working with individuals, but your media spokesperson takes that level. And the fact that you're not working one-on-one, -on -one, but the number of lives that you're impacting from just it's that one media spot now reaches far more than you can within that. Right. And that's what I feel like as a, as a, an academic and training dietitians, I taught uh, community nutrition for like 16 years. <laughs> and um, I always felt like my job was to beat the nutrition zealot out of them before they got to medical nutrition therapy, to start thinking about people eating because there are many things involved with eating than just, you know, controlling diabetes or preventing this or meeting your nutrient requirements. But, um, but the more that we can now start to impact individuals, whether you're being a, a practitioner, you're being a preceptor, you're now changing all the lives of all the people that are being affected by the people that you're training. So right. it just grows exponentially what we're able to give the profession and ultimately to health in that long run from what we invest. Yes. So yes. More than I can do as a single individual. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you for that answer. Next question. What does the future hold for you? What are you thinking? Um, I know that's kind of a hard question to answer. But, yeah. You know. Well, it's, and it's, it's kind of interesting because it's a, I always feel like it's a common conundrum that I'm always in. Um, when you, when you become a faculty member, you become assistant professor and that's, that's the beginning rank. And then, uh, especially in the tenure track where you're involved in research, it's like getting tenure and promotion takes you up to associate professor and with tenure, it's basically job stability but associate gets you to that next level and then beyond that going for uh i went for full professor several years ago um and so basically i've topped out in rank so really there's no more promotions for me next unless i was to become a dean or something like that but in my current role i'm kind of i feel like there was a frazier episode where he got the lifetime achievement award and he's like well what now <laughs> it's like is my career over but it becomes my my ways of now investing my time not so much in things that like help check off the boxes to show i'm important but to really start doing things that have a meaningful impact um so i become much more selective around a lot of these and i feel like i've been able to like I've, i'm an associate editor for the journal of nutrition education and behavior where it's really kind of helping guide our science forward um around um more kind of community oriented research that doesn't always have a home in other places um so i feel like i'm i'm making strides along that um i'm working with some colleagues on a handful of different research projects that really kind of work on innovative ways of promoting um, diet and health. So I feel like I'm at the stage where I've accumulated enough knowledge and, and wisdom that now I can start to use those in some of the more um, farther reaching types of efforts and projects. Um, but at the same time, it becomes a more of an emphasis for me for mentorship than it is about my own personal growth um, because there are the only way that we continue to grow the profession in the field is to foster those um, uh, that are coming up behind us and so i invest a lot of my time a lot more of my time now especially in this um, professor stage of helping to grow and develop those that are coming behind us, investing in our students, investing in our uh, future faculty and helping guide them along the way. It was basically academically how I was brought up. Um, stop the cycle of pain, but instead actually help usher our profession forward. And the only way we can do that is by building up those uh, coming behind us. So 
I say that's probably where most of my efforts will will continue to push. That is an awesome that is an awesome job to have because uh, much similar to this, you know, just wanting to inspire the next generation. I'd like to get uh, you know to to get out into the middle schools, get this message out to the middle schoolers, high schoolers, make the profession very appealing. Mm -hmm. Everyone eats, so everyone's an expert. But can yeah. we make them more expert by becoming dietitians and just getting mm -hmm. the message out there? Plus also the young, you know, the young professional that's just making it into the field. Maybe they have a passion for one thing. And I always encourage people like to go to Fancy or one of the other conferences because I always find it fascinating to hear people talk or give presentations and then you kind of see what's going on and you're like i want to be like that person over there that seems cool uh, you know so it's always good to just kind of see what everyone has to offer and you know i know my my claim to fame would be getting all the guys together to get the group picture mm -hmm. and you know it's like it's fun and all and i and i love it but it's like you know i'd like to get the next generation to kind of listen to all the cool people that we've met throughout the years and mm -hmm. listen to what they have to say and yeah so all but, right well, uh, with the final oh good sorry i was gonna say but that um that getting the picture together has now become a traditional legacy at fancy you know <laughs> so what so one effort that starts with this small push then starts to grow that momentum so yeah yeah so i think we got up to 48 people in one picture so my goal now we try to hit 60. <laughs> <laughs> Reach for the stars. All right. Well, cool. Well, but the last question for you, any words of wisdom for the next generation of dietitians? Um, I think it becomes, as we continue to kind of grapple with our foothold in healthcare and especially the way things are transitioning, value-based care, um, being able to show the impact that we have. I mean, you read all the articles that say 75% of chronic disease is diet related and lifestyle related, but we pay for medication and we pay for surgery, but we don't pay for nutrition Come counseling. Ahead. The only way that we're going to get there is one, document and show our outcomes. I worked with some dietitians that said, I don't know research and I never know how to do research. But the one thing I know is I know I bring in money and I'd like to know what it is. And we were able to document the amount of money that they generated from referrals and that came in that frankly, the financial officers were like, we had no idea. We thought you just cost us money and they got another mm -hmm. FTE. <laughs> so documenting your outcomes and documenting that is the only way we're really going to prove that this is what we do. And from the same side, we've got to think about the fact that when we're working with people, we're working with people and they don't want to change everything that we tell them to do because we told them to do it. Um, as I told you in Chicago with the spokespeople, not every talk has to begin with kale and quinoa. <laughs> Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I have people to tell me that all the time now. I remember that. <laughs> but I've been we, saying that for forever. <laughs> <laughs> but but we got to get to the point where we, we understand where people are and then we figure out how to help them from there. Because if we scrub everything that they eat and we're never relatable, they're never coming back and we're never going to get the outcomes. So we've really got to think about figuring how, how can we step from our idea of nutrition to their idea of nutrition and then working their way up mm -hmm. towards us rather than trying to get them here. And when they get to here, they feel like they haven't made it. Right. So how do we work with individuals to really understand what their needs are, where they're at and how we get them there? Because as a, a guest on the, what's mostly primary care focus, a lot of the times when I'm talking about the nutrition concerns, it's really about not just the what are their nutrient needs, but our understanding of food security, uh, nutrition security, behaviors, meals, uh, other influences of people's eating. Those are the skills we really need to draw on just as much as the medical nutrition therapy. So we need we understand people and we understand nutrition and dietetics. And that's where we're going to be able to, to really shine. So sometimes it gets us out of our ideology, but that's where we need to go if we're going to help individuals make advances. Right, right. I think it's more the, 
you know, we get the science and then we need the art side of it, the, the making the appeal to people, getting them to mean them where they're at and, and I guess making them feel like it's worth the effort. Cause yeah. you know, sometimes it's like, well, I'm the, I'm the expert that makes people walk out the door if they don't have any connection with you. So it's just right. getting people to connect. So, well, I greatly appreciate this. Um, thank you very much for, you know, contributing to the, to the podcast. And I, like I said, you're, you're one of the guys. It's always good to have, you know, it's always good to see what you're doing. And I, I mean, that's the best thing about social media, seeing what, what people are doing. And um, so just keep up the good work and thank you for your efforts in training the next generation of uh, food and nutrition professionals coming into the field. Cause it's definitely something that, that we need. So. Yeah. I'm also on the platform Buy Me A Coffee. This is a platform that allows creators like myself to create content and get rewarded in a variety of payments. I've decided to do it via coffee. So if you'd like to buy me a coffee, you can do so. And if you want to send one to the individual I'm interviewing, send it to me and I will send it their way. With that being said, thank you very much for being here with us today. I hope you really enjoyed the video and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.